Moi, Mobutu Sese Seko Kukumbendu Wazabanga. Many countries in Africa and the Caribbean suffer under kleptocratic regimes, where the country is controlled and run for the benefit of an individual or a small group who use their power to transfer a large fraction of the society's resources to themselves. The 32-year rule of the Congo by Mobutu was the biggest kleptocracy in Africa that made him the world's richest head of state. In this episode, we shall look at the rise and fall of Mobutu Seseko of Zaire and how he managed to rule and plunder the Congo for 32 years. Joseph Desire Mobutu was the second and longest serving president of the DRC, the biggest country in sub-Saharan Africa and one of the world's poorest and longest suffering. He committed numerous human rights atrocities and enriched himself, his family and friends on the wealth of the country, while its citizens suffered from widespread poverty. His rise and a long span in power are mostly attributed to the support he received from the United States of America because of his anti-communist stand, even though the West was fully aware of his actions. Mobutu was a member of the Bandi ethnic group, born in 1930 in Lisara, Belgian Congo. His mother, Mali Mendelin Yemo, was a hotel maid who fled to Lisara to escape the harem of a local village chief. While there, she met and married Alberic Bemani, a cook for a Belgian judge and shortly afterwards she gave birth to Mobutu. But sadly, Mobutu's father passed away when he was eight. As a young child, Mobutu was rebellious and had utilitarian education at the hands of Catholic monks who were impressed with his intelligence and discipline. However, the impression did not last as he was kicked out of missionary school for traveling to Kinshasa in search of women, alcohol and adventure for which he was banished to the army. In 1956, after serving in the Belgian Congolese army, he became a full-time journalist, and it's around this time that he became friends with Patrice Lumumba and joined Lumumba's Mouvement National Congolais, MNC. When Lumumba became Prime Minister after independence, Mobutu was chosen to be his personal secretary. He was later elevated to Chief of Staff of the Congolese Army in the 1960s during the Congolese crisis, making him the third most strongest person in the country at the time. The crisis emerged due to a secessionist violence in the south, provoked by a Belgian government who were the former colonial masters, determined to preserve its access to rich Congolese mines and natural resources. During the crisis, Lumumba turned to the Soviet Union for assistance and received massive military aid. However, this was a threat to the US, which saw the Soviet involvement in the Congo as a ploy to spread communist influence in Central Africa. Joseph Kasavubu, the president at the time, angered by Soviet presence, dismissed Lumumba and in turn Lumumba did the same to Kasavubu. Both Lumumba and Kasavubu then ordered Mobutu to arrest the other. Given he was the chief of staff, he was expected to handle the situation. However, Mobutu and Kasavubu's ADs were bankrolled by Western governments, as well as the soldiers, so they decided to rid the country of Soviets to impress their funders. On September 14, 1960, Mobutu took control of the DRC in a CIA-sponsored coup. He placed Lumumba under house arrest and accused him of pro-communist sympathies. To further appease and gain US support, he ordered all Soviet advisors to leave the Congo and kept Kasavubu as president. At this point, Mobutu had established himself as the strongest man in the Congo, though he wasn't yet the head of state, just yet. When Lumumba fled the capital two months later, he was arrested and killed in February 1961. Mobutu, the Belgians, and the CIA denied any involvement. However, evidence later surfaced that suggested the opposite. In the communist world, Lumumba was honored as a martyr, and protests took place in different parts of the world. In 1965, a constitutional crisis developed in which Prime Minister Moise Shombe and the President Joseph Kasavubu wrestled for power. Mobutu saw an opportunity and launched a successful coup that toppled Kasavubu and quickly established himself as dictator and the head of a one-party state, the MPR, Popular Movement for the Revolution. After seizing power, Mobutu quickly found means to keep and entrench himself in power. He started by setting a dictatorial tone telling a large crowd gathered in Kinshasa Stadium that politicians had ruined the country. He said, this is why on November 24, 1965, the stupid struggle for influence in which political parties were engaged was ended. For five years, there will be no more political party activity in the country. Mobutu. Mobutu's early years in office were a period of relative calm. 
many of Mobutu's harshest critics acknowledge one achievement. See, the Congo has 450 ethnic groups that had French as an official language but no commonly spoken tongue. Mobutu managed to forge a sense of nationhood in Africa's largest country. This was accomplished in part by successfully promoting the use of three major African languages, Lingala, Swahili, and Shuruba, to draw citizens together across ethnic lines. At the same time, Zaire experienced a period of extraordinary cultural creativity in song, fashion, and art. This came about partly as a result of deliberate efforts to favor local influences over foreign ones. Such policies made Mobutu popular among the masses. Dubbed the master calculator, Mobutu employed more strategies to maintain his grip on power. These included the military, nationalistic ideology, and notably the philosophy of Mobutuism. The philosophy was difficult to pin down in terms of economic matters, as it was liberal but also Maoist in social control, anti-communist but also anti-capitalist. There were bits of pieces here and there, a political stew in which he tossed every ingredient he chose. He welcomed continued support from America while at the same time traveling to Beijing for inspiration. He renamed the Congo and its cities. Congo became Zaire, Leopoldville became Kinshasa, and Stanleyville became Kisangani. In 1971, Mobutu launched a new twist to the official ideology, with a program known as Authenticity. In these changes, Zaireans were obliged to change their Western names to African ones, drop titles like Mr. and Mrs. in favor of citizen, and abandon European dress codes for tunics for men and wraps of printed cloth for women. Also, Western-style attire was banned and replaced with the Mao-style tunic labeled the Abacost and its female equivalent. The people had to be rechristened and were to abandon their Christian names for more authentic ones, which had to sound tribal for Mobutu's liking. He sought to set the tone by replacing his given name, Joseph Desire Mobutu, with Mobutu Seseseko Kokumbendu Wazabanga, meaning the all-conquering warrior who, because of his endurance and inflexible will to win, will go from conquest to conquest, leaving fire in his wake. In 1973, authenticity was followed by Zarianization, a program that seized all farms, factories, and businesses belonging to foreigners from Belgians, Greeks, Jewish, and Pakistan traders who had dominated much of the country's small-scale commerce. The country's economy was given away like a goodie bag at a children's party, and only Mobutu's faithful supporters were invited. Shopkeepers were given factories that produced their goods, a musician was given a shopping mall, overnight a governor of Katanga was said to have become the owner of nearly all businesses in his province. With this, he created a sprawling culture of patronage. As for Mobutu, he would require an exceptional reward for this program. Well, because he is Mobutu, he treated himself to 14 plantations and dipped into the country's mining industry as he pleased. In a speech on November 30, 1973, Mobutu described the new policy as a decisive turning point in our history and justified it by calling Zaire the country which until now has been the most heavily exploited in the world. But in reality, this was just a series of populist decrees designed to distract the people from the more pressing concerns on where the money was going. The nationalizations and handing out of businesses to politically selected Zairians were initially popular. It was not long before things began to backfire. With almost no prior experience in the businesses they inherited, many Zairians quickly sought to lure foreigners back to run them in their place, and others just simply sold off their goods and failed to restock. One cannot mention Mobutu without discussing the Cold War. He was the strongest Cold War ploy in Africa in his era. At the height of the Cold War, Mobutu thrived on crises, buying off enemies when he did not kill them outright. He used crucial financial aid from foreign allies with ranging strategic, economic, political, and commercial interests in Africa due to the strategic location of the Congo. His chief patron was the United States, which provided two billion U.S. dollars in foreign assistance. In return, Washington got a secure base for operations in neighboring Angola, where Western-backed UNITA rebels were locked in a long civil war with Marxist government supported by Cuban troops and Soviet arms. France, Morocco, and Belgium were also key Mobutu allies, who at crucial points both sent paratroopers to help in suppressing revolts. In return, France was granted a base in his country for operations in Chad and elsewhere in its former African empire. Like Stalin in the Soviet Union and Saddam Hussein in Iraq, 
Mobutu consolidated his power by developing a cult of his own personality. Pictures of him were printed by tens of thousands and sent to every part of the country. Every word of his was recorded. He was the only official voice of Zaire. His hold over Zaireans was almost mystical. In a land where superstition is an important part of the culture, it was rumored that the carved black walking stick he, he always carried in public had magical powers, that it was so heavy a normal person could not lift it. While exalting himself, he purposely kept the army weak, although there was a well-paid and well-armed military auxiliary called the Presidential Division, which he trusted for his protection. Nothing defined Mobutu's regime as corruption. Gaining a fortune estimated between 5 billion US dollars to 10 billion. Graft was Mobutu's first choice as a way of rewarding friends and disarming opponents. Stealing was so widespread that the word kleptocracy was coined to describe his regime. In a speech in 1977, Mobutu described his country by saying, Everything is for sale. Anything can be bought in our country. He suggested that it should only be done discreetly, saying, If you want to steal nicely, steal a little. But if you steal too much to get rich overnight, you will be caught. Mobutu aimed to use the state for his own enrichment and his family. In the 1970s, 15-20% to 20 of the operating budget of the state went directly to Mobutu. In 1977, Mobutu's family took 71 million US dollars from the National Bank for personal use, and by nearly the 1980s, his fortune was estimated at 5 billion, making him the world's richest head of state and the eighth richest man in the world at the time. Mobutu had extensive holdings in Zaire as well as deposits and estates in Europe. For visits abroad, he sometimes chartered a Concorde. In the 1980s, he imported 5,000 sheep from Venezuela for one of his ranches. He did this by ordering government-owned DC-8 to make 32 round trips between Caracas and Zaire. His most ambitious project was the rebuilding of his ancestral village of Badolite. Badolite's most famous son, Mobutu, constructed two lavish palaces, one for hosting affairs of the state and a private residence and a village of Chinese pagodas. These shrines were stuffed with Italian marble, antique French furniture, Venetian chandeliers, expensive tapestries, and monogrammed silver cutlery. Fashionable chefs and Parisian pastry and Belgian mussels were flown in from the capital cities of Europe. Badolite's airstrip was extended to accommodate a Concorde, which Mobutu would chatter from Air France. The sailors burst with thousands of bottles of pink champagne and vintage wine. It almost took 1,000 expensively uniformed staff to keep the palaces in shape. Guests included Pope John Paul II, Boutros Boutros Gali, several French presidents, and a who is who of questionable businessmen. It is estimated that Mobutu spent up to 400 million US dollars on his Badolite palaces. The story of Mobutu's wealth and riches would require a full episode that we shall have to look into the future. Under his leadership, a nation with seemingly unlimited prospects became one of the poorest in the world. By the late 1980s, per capita income was less than a tenth of what it had been at independence. In the 1990s, the degree of poverty dropped below measurable levels. Hyperinflation rendered the currency worthless and butter trade became the usual means of exchange. In the context of Cold War, Mobutu's abuse of human rights counted less for Washington than his anti-communist credentials. Mobutu first became an asset of the CIA in 1959 during a meeting in Brussels. He later met several US presidents, including Ronald Reagan, who twice welcomed him to Washington and called him a voice of good sense and goodwill. By the early 1990s, however, the conditions that had made him a valuable ally had changed. The great rivalry between Washington and Moscow had been settled in Washington's favor, and the US diplomats began to suggest that time had come for Mobutu to step aside. As Cold War era leaders around him began to fall, Mobutu hung on with promises of reform, but his pledge in 1990 to hold multi-party elections was never fulfilled. Furthermore, opposition marches were met with military force. In 1991 and 1993, riots by Zairean army, which had not been paid, tipped the situation into a freefall crisis. Kinshasa and other cities were looted with heavy loss of life. As he grew even more isolated, Mobutu spent most of his time in Badolite, living on a yacht on the river Zaire. The end of Mobutu came with surprising speed after the Rwandese Tusi-led government supported an uprising by the Congolese Tusi, who had come under attack in eastern Zaire. In October 1996, three weeks into the fighting, what had been a Tusi uprising turned into a full-blown political rebellion against Mobutu, led by Kabira. Once Kabila's forces seized the major cities of the Congo in the Far East, 
African leaders with scores to settle against Mobutu lined up to help the rebels with money, men, and arms. The anti-Mobutu coalition came to include Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Angola, where Mobutu had interfered the most in three decades of his rule. When Bill Richardson, the U.S. delegate to the United Nations and President Clinton's special envoy, visited Zaire to England Mobutu's resignation, the aging cancer-ridden president asked him why after years of loyal service and friendship with the West he had been abandoned. Richardson replied, I said the mess you are in is not our mess. You just didn't govern your own country. Mobutu went into temporary exile in Togo until President Jinsimba Yadema insisted that he leave the country. Soon after, he went to Morocco, where he owned several homes. While there, he sought permission to travel to France for treatment for prostate cancer, a request the French government refused. Instead, the friend Mobutu was admitted to a military hospital in Rabat and died in September 1977 at the age of 66. He was buried in an above-ground mausoleum at Rabat Saleh in Christian Cemetery. On the same day, Mobutu fled into exile. Lolong de Zire Kabila became the new president of Zaire and quickly renamed it the Congo. He was assassinated in 2001 and succeeded by his son, Joseph Kabira. The story of Mobutu is similar to other stories of leaders from developing nations of that period who took advantage of Cold War between the US and the USSR to further themselves politically and financially. While Mobutu and his family and friends lived the life of luxury, his nation suffered from poor infrastructure and economic growth. If it was not for the support he had from the US, he more than likely would have been overthrown much sooner. However, due to America's obsession with communists versus anti-communists, he led Zaire virtually unchecked for 30 years. Thank you very much for listening. If you want more episodes like this, please subscribe and share. Bye-bye.